On January 12, 2010, a massive 7.0 earthquake struck Haiti, devastating the island and killing over 300,000 people in the process. Over 100,000 homes were destroyed and an estimated 2 million people left homeless. Haiti's problems were severe and the earthquake and devastation created new opportunities for predators to take full advantage of the situation and use the tragedy to prey upon the victims for personal gain and profit. The country was declared open for business and while the Haitian people suffered, the Clintons cashed in. There are new accusations today of pay-to-play scandals rocking the Clinton campaign. New details of a possible influence peddling in the aftermath of the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, which we all remember very well. We have seen before the capacity that Haiti has for violence in the 2004 coup, in the 2008 food riots, and it could slip towards that situation again, becoming survival of the fittest. A very lucrative opportunity for companies from all over the world to grab the billions that were pledged for rebuilding. But now, unless you're in a search and rescue team or a medical team, the best thing you can do is give money. After the earthquake, countries around the world donate billions of dollars to help Haiti rebuild. Bill Clinton was in charge of that money. What did he do? He kept the money. Give now and lives will be saved. Uh, you can text Haiti at 2022. Send a text message, $10 will be forwarded to it. We'll move that money in a hurry, but everybody, this is one of those things where $5 can make a difference. A lot of tweets have been soliciting donations through text messages, but folks really have to be careful that they don't get conned here because the worst people come out in the worst times. And, you know, when she raises this money, every time she raises money, she's making deals. To say, could I be the ambassador to this? Could I do that? Make sure my business is taken care of. I mean, give me a break. All of the money she's raising, that's blood money. You know, we, we need to the help and the generosity of the American people. We have a, a text messaging system that the State Department set up. It's Haiti, H-A-I-T-I, uh, to 90999. We've raised about $3 million for the Red Cross. It took only a glance to see what the rains did to the largest camp in Port-au-Prince. Estimates vary, but up to 200,000 people have lost their lives. Please, uh, if you can, contribute. $10 will be uh, uh, billed to your cell phone, and it's helping us get the food, the water, the medical supplies that we need. The Clintons, Hillary Clinton, should be behind bars. She have no business running for president. We need somebody like Donald Trump in the White House to make America great. So other countries around the world will respect America again. As soon as the earthquake hit, Bill and Hillary Clinton took action and they portrayed themselves as the saviors of Haiti and immediately launched a relief effort that eventually raked in billions of dollars in relief aid. But as it turns out, very little of that money actually got to the poor people of Haiti. It was a scam. Hillary Clinton abused her position in the State Department to skim most of the relief aid donations for herself and for her husband, for her brother, and of course, all of her corporate buddies. It's estimated that only 10% of the donations actually made it to the programs to help Haiti. Wow, un believable. I mean, what kind of monsters are these people, the Clintons? We're talking about, this is organized crime, the Clinton Foundation which is nothing more than a slush fund. This is a tax-free international money laundering scheme and maybe the largest criminal enterprise in U.S. history. Hillary 
Clinton supporters, join us, won't you? Let's journey back to January 12th, 2010. Hillary Clinton had been the United States Secretary of State for about a year when a catastrophic 7.0 earthquake crisis rocked Haiti 16 miles west of Port-au-Prince. Somewhere between 160,000 to 316,000 Haitians died while 2 million Haitians were displaced. The survivors cobbled together what they could, creating temporary communities as they waited for the world to help, only to witness the globalists using the disaster as a money-making scheme. And in walked the Clintons and the United Nations, bringing with them a cholera epidemic that infected 700,000 Haitians and killed at least 9,000. That it's simply not acceptable for the UN to be responding to its own responsibility for having caused the world the worst cholera epidemic in the world by not doing anything for the victims. Nearly thirteen and a half billion dollars in aid that was mysteriously squandered. We are telling the world of the crimes that Bill and Hillary Clinton are responsible for in Haiti, and we are telling the American people that the thirty two thousand over thirty two thousand emails that Hillary Clinton said she deleted have evidence of the crimes they've committed. Formaldehyde-laced cancer-causing trailers and a legion of corporations that would use Haiti's humanitarian crisis to line their own pockets, taking at least 25% off the top of every project they were awarded. WikiLeaks revealed the Haitian U.S. Ambassador Kenneth H. Merton wrote in a cable just 20 days after the catastrophic quake, other companies are proposing their housing solutions or their land use planning ideas or other construction concepts. Each is vying for the ear of the president in a veritable free-for-all. The military logistics personnel intend to surge to around-the-clock operations until the offload is complete. The gold rush is on. And so a slew of corporations were slated to help rebuild Haiti under the U.S. Secretary of State's Interim Haiti Recovery Commission, overseen by none other than former U.S. President Bill Clinton. The IHRC approved over $330 million in projects funded by the U.S. government, including Northern Industrial Park to accommodate 18,000 new jobs in garment, textile, and other fields by 2014. This industrial park actually brought only 10% of the jobs it promised. Port-au-Prince neighborhoods to upgrade and provide services to earthquake-affected neighborhoods enabling displaced persons to return. According to Amnesty International, around 37,000 houses are known to have been repaired, rebuilt, or built. However, less than 20% of the housing solutions provided as a response to the disaster could be seen as long-term or sustainable. Instead, most programs have simply provided temporary measures such as the construction of temporary shelters and the allocation of rental subsidies. Initially, $53 million was spent to build 15,000 new homes, but this number morphed into $93 million for 2,600 homes, while $70 million was spent on building townhouses for the IHRC staff and roughly $20 million to build two soccer fields. Anyone can surmise that the Haitian people would have been far better off had the Clintons taken their foundation fleecing scheme elsewhere. Clearly, a ruthless strategy plundered this third world catastrophe. Aside from a handful of houses, a Caribbean cell phone hub enriching its globalist owners, and two multi-million dollar soccer stadiums. Stadiums, Haiti remains unchanged. A majority of displaced Haitians still have no electricity, plumbing, and running water. John Bound for Infowars.com. All right, and we are joined now by political insider and best selling author Roger Stone. StoneColdTruth.com is a website. And he's here with us today to talk about the Clinton Foundation and the rape of Haiti. Because I think this is about as low as you can go. We've all heard a lot about the criminal enterprise of the Clinton Foundation, much of which, by the way, is covered in Roger Stone's latest book, The Clinton's War on Women. And I think of all the criticism surrounding the corrupt Clinton Foundation, there's no better example of Haiti because Hillary Clinton screwed those people over big time. Roger Stone, your thoughts? Yeah, this is a story of plunder uh, and the yeah. plunder of people who are who are devastated 
by an earthquake. I mean, this is a, this is an epic tale of theft, uh, and it indicts both the Clintons and the Bushes yep. because they have a joint charity, which it can only be called a scam. I mean, th th this is kind of twofold. On the one hand, they spend a small fraction of the hundred and twenty-eight million dollars they pulled together for actual on-the-ground activities in Haiti, and then they deliver the contracts to vendors who are cronies who provide substandard work if they provide work at all. Uh, there's a Ponzi scam here based in Miami that involves uh, Jeb Bush and the Clintons, uh, where uh, one guy got huge contracts to build housing that never really existed. So uh, this is a classic Clinton ripoff. I don't have to tell you, the Clinton Foundation is not a charity. It's a slush it's fund. A slush fund. Yeah. It's a criminal enterprise, and, and you know, and when it comes to Haiti, we're talking about one of the largest relief efforts in world history, and Bill and Hillary Clinton were in charge of it all. And five years later, Haiti looks like it just got hit by the earthquake yesterday. Where's all that money going? Yeah, no, look, this is profiteering, uh, and, it, and it is tragic. Black Lives Matter unless you live in Haiti, in which case we're going to use your misfortune to uh, fleece the American public and to raise millions, which we can put in our pockets. Yeah. Uh, I predicted on InfoWars some weeks ago that Haiti would become one of the major issues uh, in this campaign. Uh, I'm told that Mr. Assange at WikiLeaks has a number of documents that relate to Haiti that perhaps we haven't seen yet. So uh, this is going to be a festering sore in the sides of the Clintons. Well, I, sh I sure hope so. And I want to read a quote by Donald Trump, who said recently, Hillary Clinton was using the State Department to dole out special favors and access to her friends and donors. It's called pay for play. And Trump has also referred to it as blood money. What are the chances that Donald Trump is going to bring up Haiti in the upcoming debates? I think that's what's so exciting about the debates. Yeah, me too. And that is one unpredictable thing one predictable thing about Donald Trump is that he's entirely unpredictable and he has an embarrassment of riches in terms of vulnerabilities of the Clintons it could be the Clinton Foundation it could be Benghazi and the lies involved there it could be uh, uh, Hillary Clinton's health uh, it could be uh, uh, her failure as Secretary of State uh, in the Middle East in which she has made the place a, cow a powder keg where she is uh, enabled our enemies and undercut our allies. So who knows where Trump will come? This I do know. He's a brawler. Mm -hmm. He is fearless. No doubt about he it. He is courageous and he is well aware of the facts. Well, I tell you what, the Haitian people, they're, <laughs> Bill and Hillary Clinton are probably the two most unpopular people in, in Haiti and, and for the entire world for that matter. And I think that, you know, we know that there's been massive protest over Haiti in Haiti. And there's also been protests right here in America outside the Clinton Foundation buildings. And I also think that once the average American voter learns about this, especially within the, the black communities, it's over for her. She's done. Yeah, look, anytime you have a charity that is spending a whopping 10% on actual charitable activities, <laughs> and even those activities are questionable, these are people who distributed millions of dollars worth of HIV uh, drugs uh, to fight AIDS that have never been approved by the FDA and may have done more damage than good. Uh, but they bought them from a Clinton crony who happened to be in the pharmaceutical business. Look, this is a scam. Uh, and it's hard to understand how the Internal Revenue Service has time to audit Donald Trump's taxes while ignoring numerous detailed complaints about the violations of law and transparency uh, and self-dealing in the Clinton Foundation. Yeah, once again, she's above the law. Well, that, but when I worked for Nixon, that was the mantra of the left. Absolutely. No one is above the law, yeah. we shall see. All right, stonecoldtruth.com is the website. And also, you could purchase his book at rogerstone.com, The Clinton's War on Women. It's also available right now at InfoWars store.com. It's a very good read. I recommend that you purchase this and send, send a copy to your friends and family and do it before the election. Roger Stone, good to see you. Many thanks. Glad to be here.
Unfortunately, you've grown up hearing voices that incessantly warn of government as nothing more than some separate sinister entity that's at the root of all our problems. It's time to stop submitting to this tyranny. It's time to realize that we're being enslaved. Some of these same vo voices also do their best to gum up the works. They'll warn that tyranny's always lurking just around the corner. Tyranny with a capital T. You should reject these voices. Everything that's been done with torture, rendition, the NDAA, the Patriot Acts 1 and 2, from day one was focused on the American people, period. That's it. It's always been about erasing the Bill of Rights and Constitution and rolling out NSA spying publicly, saying it's for Al-Qaeda, rolling out torture, saying it's for Al-Qaeda, but it's really for the general public, rolling out total control and the end of any underground free market systems in the name of fighting Al-Qaeda, but really shutting down any type of free commerce. This is all about converting us from a free society to a tyranny with a capital T. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Darren McBreen. It is Thursday, September 15th, 2016. And here's a quick look at what's coming up. Tonight, natural disaster, tragedy in Haiti. The world's heart went out to the victims, but Hillary saw dollar signs for herself and her cronies. We set up a website, $10 will be forwarded to it. We'll move that money in a hurry, but everybody, this is one of those things where $5 can make a difference. Billions of dollars of aid poured into Haiti with only 10% going to the victims. Tonight, we look at the Clinton Foundation's actions in Haiti. They portrayed themselves as saviors, but we look at how the Clinton Foundation participated in the rape of Haiti. And Roger Stone reveals how the Clinton Foundation operates as a slush fund, as well as its ties to the Bush family. All that and more on tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. Bill Clinton was in charge of that money. What did he do? He kept the money. All right, we're talking about the Clinton Foundation and the rape of Haiti and how Hillary Clinton, as Secretary of State in 2010, took full advantage of not only the crisis in Haiti after they were hit by a devastating 7.0 earthquake, but Hillary Clinton also took advantage of us, the American people. When she asked for donations, in a relief effort that ended up in the hands of her corporate buddies and Bill and Hillary's personal bank accounts. And a lot of tweets have been soliciting donations through text messages, but folks really have to be careful that they don't get conned here because the worst people come out in the worst times. We basically need now food, water, shelter, and medical supplies. We identified some places for large numbers of people to seek shelter today. But if, if anyone wants to help now, not two weeks from now, a month from now, we'll need lots of rebuilding help, lots of volunteer help. But now, unless you're in a search and rescue team or a medical team, the best thing you can do is give money. You know, we, we need uh, the help and the generosity of the American people. We have a, a text messaging system that the State Department set up. It's Haiti, H-A-I-T-I, -I, uh, to 90999. We've raised about $3 million for the Red Cross. That's what's needed right now. Uh, please, uh, if you can, contribute. $10 will be uh, uh, billed to your cell phone, and it's helping us get the food, the water, the medical supplies that we need. InfoWars reporter Margaret Howell joins us now to talk about the stolen Haitian relief money that was orchestrated by the Clintons. And this really hit close to home to me because I actually gave money. I don't think it was to the Clinton Foundation. I don't remember. I just remember at the time they were giving out phone numbers and everybody across the world, lots of people donated to the cause. What did you learn? Isn't that amazing? So we, we're, we've learned that these war criminals were in charge of the humanitarian aid relief for Haiti. 
Uh, she was Secretary of State at the time in 2010. She flies to Haiti um, in this big, massive federal, uh, you know, airplane. Mm -hmm. It stops the relief aid that's getting in because it was already bottlenecked. So her stupid appearance, it was stopping the aid beginning to flow in. That was the, that should have been a trigger point at that. Uh, you know, something something is amiss. But it was a woman. photo op as well. Correct. So she it was, was there op. for the photo op. It starts there. So she's in charge of the relief effort, being the Secretary of State, the major agency in charge of overseeing it. Mm -hmm. And what she does. Darren, it is so despicable. So she realizes that the money is going to begin funneling in. She makes her husband the head of the Haiti Reconstruction Commission, which means that all of the relief money is flow. It goes through Bill Clinton. Thirteen billion in all is what went through him. This was supposed to be, you know, hot. We, we talked about the famous hospital. We'll get to that in a second. Mm -hmm. uh, houses, um, a textile plant, an industrial park. Cheryl Mills was her chief of staff at the time. Mm -hmm. This woman went to Haiti 30 times in four years. And you... You want to tell me that not a single one of these projects was was put into fruition. You know, they built a fraction of the houses they were supposed to build. This hospital, you know, 800 million that she took for a hospital and we're still waiting on it six years later. You know, they, no, it's the been like six years since the earthquake <laughs> and, and it looks like the earthquake just happened oh, yesterday. Seriously? Nothing's been done. And there's also reports that get this 10 percent of the relief money. That's Disgusting. it. That's what went to the Disgusting. Asian people. Not only that, but Clinton had this vested interest in lining the pockets of her donors as mm. well as her own. So uh, pay to play contract. She basically used her position uh, that was supposed to be used as, as this ombudsman for aid to, to give it to these poor people that had lost everything they had. They were living in, the, living in these USAID tents at the time. No running water, no plumbing. Uh, you know, their children naked, screaming. You, you know those photographs. We've mm -hmm. all seen them. So she takes their disaster, and it's the worst sort of disaster capitalism, the ultimate crony capitalism I have ever seen. She decides to profit, uh, self-enrich, if you will, mm -hmm. on the backs of these people. And she does it. Let me, let me just give you an example of how she does it. So $124 million goes to one project for a textile mill in the northern part of Haiti. And Which ended up being a sweatshop. Correct. Now, yes. let me get this straight. Okay, I know the northern part of Haiti was not struck by the earthquake. It was not damaged. Correct. So there's no reason to build anything on the uh, north side. No. So Absolutely. this was ended up being a sweatshop. Those folks are making 61 cents an, an, an hour. Mm -hmm. That's it. And they're working 16-hour days. Look she it up. She was supposed to create 16,000 jobs with that 16 to 20. Reports vary. I mean, it was supposed to be, even if that's not the place where the, where the earthquake hit. You know, mm -hmm. okay, let's do At some At least they're good. creating jobs. Let's industrialize mm -hmm. Haiti a bit. Let's make them a little self-sufficient. That's one example of this. Hey, well, you know, before you go, I, I just want to say this, that I remember the grand opening of this sweatshop, of course, that's not what they called it. Right. But Bill and Clinton, uh, Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton were both there, grandstanding once again, mm -hmm. acting like they're the saviors of Haiti. Mm -hmm. They had this it's huge, despicable. huge grand opening, and the Hollywood elite were there. Uh, ben, St actor Ben Stiller mm -hmm. was there, and of course, Sean Penn was there, and they uh. made a big deal out of this, knowing full well that this was just to line the it's pockets of their corporate friends, and this is a front despicable. It's a front, and mm -hmm. what we see this time, and again, $13 billion is what we're talking about, and these poor people, the victims of this massive natural disaster saw a fraction of it. You know, they're still suffering all this time later because of these war criminals at the helm lining their own pockets. You know, you and I talked off camera about uh, what some of the contracts. They were looking for mining contracts, and I found this um, in my research today. VCG Mining, it's a gold mining contract. Her brother sits on the board of this mining company. Mm -hmm. So she's so she's essentially, uh, they've set up this so that they're, they're taking everything that they can out of this ravaged country, including their gold. They want it, they want it all. They which is going all. which is going to Hillary's brother. And this is the <laughs> first gold mining contract that was awarded to Haiti in 50 years. God. Somehow, magically gets awarded. Oh, lo and behold, to Hillary's brother, isn't that nice? Right, and Bill Clinton, you know, what really makes me sick, you see him go, we're going to build this back better than ever, stronger than ever. The only thing they did was steal and rob from these people. They robbed them blind. She used her State Department position, her chief of staff going to Haiti yep. 30 times. Are you kidding me? Oh, this is all money, 30 money, times? money. Yeah. She was doing it to oversee this industrial park. Tens of millions of dollars flown into that. that nothing ever came of that. Where's that money, Darren? Yeah. Look, the Haitian people got nothing, but the good side of this story is people are waking up. Mm -hmm. 
And Haitian Americans are waking up. In fact, we're going to show you a protest that just happened recently. And I think that once the American, the average American voter, once they find out about this, they are going to be very upset, mm -hmm. especially the voters within the black communities, because this shows you what they think of this is how much they value. No, yeah, they, they don't care. They don't care, man. I, I tell you what, this is the most despicable thing I have seen in a long time. Let's take a look at this uh, protester, this Haitian protester that had this to say right outside of the Clinton Foundation just a couple of weeks ago. After the earthquake, countries around the world donate billions of dollars to help Haiti rebuild. Bill Clinton was in charge of that money. What did he do? He kept the money. There, are, there were hundreds of homes who were destroyed after the earthquake. And the people are still hungry. They have no food, no jobs, no homes. This is not right. The Clintons, Hillary Clinton, should be behind bars. So there you go. Obviously, Haitian Americans not too pleased with the Clinton Foundation. And just imagine this. We've, we've seen what Hillary Clinton did as Secretary of State, how she abused her power. Imagine what she will do as president mm -hmm. of the United States. We cannot allow this to happen. Look, you're absolutely right. We cannot allow this woman to have the keys to the White House. It is plain and simple. Look what she did to those poor kids in Haiti, those poor kids that her husband did in Iraq, those 500,000 kids in Syria. You know, We cannot let this woman get anywhere near this White House. And we really love the truth here, Darren. We love our viewer, our audience. We care about your well-being. And that's why we do this job. That's why we bring this information to people, because we really care about them. We care about this country. And we see what she's doing all over the globe. And you think she's not going to do that here? You just wait. That's right, Margaret. And I think once the average American voter finds out about this, especially the black community, it is over for Hillary Clinton and possibly even, even the Clinton Foundation. Game over. Hillary Clinton is a devious, unprincipled, dishonest, cold-blooded criminal, and, and not only does she not deserve the vote of the American people, she deserves to be behind bars. Hillary for prison 2016. Indian 4's nightly news is going to take a quick break right now. We'll be right back. Stick around. Owen Schroyer from Infowars.com, and recently we have been documenting the Islamification of Europe and what this has done to European society and culture. A recent viral video shows Turkish migrants in the Netherlands terrorizing the streets of their cities and their civilians. Now, we got the expected reaction from the left, specifically leftist Socialist Party leader Patrick Zumermeyer says that these are just un polished diamonds. So what we have done here is we have compiled a video of they're all in Europe and these are all migrant attacks happening to European citizens. Now let's go ahead and roll this video and I will provide a little commentary as we watch what happens when migrants attack in Europe. We're in Berry Park today, We're just walking down the high street. There's um, about 20 or so of us. We're giving out newspapers, we've got our Christian crosses, and we are going through the town centre. We've already had a bit of hostility, but we're marching through. This is a British town, and we are proud to be British. So there you see British citizens going through their own city and being antagonized and mistreated by Muslim migrants. Now here you see more waiting at the border to try to get in. There's a baby, that's the youngest crowd surfer ever. They're crowd surfing their own babies. But you see, this is what the globalists want. They want to frack into our cultures with these waves of immigrants. And as we could see in the first video, they don't want to assimilate. They have an aggressive mindset that they are going to take over Europe. So here we see police trying to man these crowds. Here's another video of more migrants trying to cross over police lines. These are violent people. Now, this is a serious issue that Americans need to realize is going on. Do you want this to happen in your country? Luckily, we aren't a landlocked country like 
many of these countries in Europe that are facing these problems. But look at what these migrants are doing to the citizens of these countries, the citizens that allow them to come in, the citizens that provide welfare for these people to survive. And this is how they get treated. They get beaten up in the streets. They get taunted in the streets. They get told that their culture is going to be gone and, and they're just beaten. Look at this. This is most likely probably after school, some kid walking home from school, a European citizen and two Muslim migrants find him and they just decide they're going to beat the crap out of him. Just, just relentlessly. And you can hear the guy filming, laughing about it. You know, he's not going to step in. It doesn't matter that this kid is getting his head kicked in. They're just going to laugh about it. But this this is a young man. This is a young man who probably grew up in a very tough society in chaos. He's never lived in civilized society. And he's jealous when he sees a white European who has any privilege at all, who doesn't understand chaos and oppression. Now, this is unbelievable. This is a video from a migrant, cramp, uh, migrant camp in Germany. Look at this woman tries to pick up a, a chair to defend herself, and then a guy comes and rips it out of her hand. Look at this. These people get brought into Germany a, a chance to be involved in a civilized culture, and then it turns into a WWE match. I mean, what am I watching here? Do you want to get away from your war-torn countries and, and try to settle? in a civilized country, or do you want to behave like animals? Why would we want to assimilate with these people when this is how they behave? Here's another example of a student beating a woman. Now, I give credit to this girl. She defends herself. Look at that tough girl. And then he says, no, go back on the ground. And he's going to go ahead and smash her face into the ground. Here's another example. Look, Islamic culture in its orthodoxy has no respect for women, folks. Okay? You really don't see anything like this. Listen to this. White French being beaten up by predominantly Muslim immigrant gangs. Violent crime can happen anywhere and to anyone, and for many reasons. But in parts of France, it has become especially dangerous to be white. This French report says almost one in five Frenchmen have been victims of there it is again. insults or worse. A few cases have even gone to trial. This Frenchman named Max, he's been attacked more than... The media won't cover this, though. And people are increasingly living in fear. They fear the imposition of Islamic law and the organized violence against any French person, including the police. For all its generosity... And we just saw that. They said, down with the police, go to hell. They said, down with Britain, go to hell. Now, this is a report shot by 60 Minutes. They are first documenting what the migrants have done to Sweden. There's pictures of Sweden, but what they found when they actually put their reporters' boots on the ground was unbelievable. Let's re roll this audio. There are now 55 declared no-go zones in Sweden where police have to escort ambulances That means if you're white or a police safety. officer, you can't go in the zone. Within minutes of us arriving, a group of young men make it clear we're not wanted and deliberately run down our cameramen. Whoops! Hey, 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 hey. Go on. The police leave, and as we prepare to go, young men masking their faces arrive. Good, you're doing good. You're doing Cowards. Good. Yeah, okay. Very good. Okay, you too. The police leave, then they step up and they hide their face and throw objects at cameramen and kick them. Just because they're white media. I don't know where we are leaving, but you don't need, you don't need to hurt us. There's no need to be unkind. You can't feel it. You can't feel it. No, no, no. 60 Minutes even admit they, they weren't expecting this type of reaction. They, they didn't expect the minute they arrived to start being harassed. They didn't expect that their experience there would include being terrorized by migrants. They just went there to document what was going on, and then they end up getting completely bullied by these people. Now, this is a video from Italy where a bunch of migrants decided that they were just going to raid uh, whatever this little restaurant is. Look at this. Just swarming. Now, again, these are people that come from war-torn countries. A lot of these people may have never even experienced life in a civilized society, in civilized culture. These are desperate people, okay? I'm not sitting here saying that I don't feel bad for the plight of their lives. I'm not even sitting here saying that our governments aren't responsible for a lot of this going on. Look at the second wave comes in. They completely ravage this business. But the issue here is 
You can't force these people into our cultures. You cannot force these people into our civilizations. What you just saw on the video is what you're going to get if we force immigration into our countries and ignore what's actually happening in the Middle East. We're not trying to rebuild the Middle East, ladies and gentlemen. If you look at our foreign policies, if you look at what we've done with proxy wars in the Middle East, we have not helped rebuild the Middle East. We have destabilized that region. And that is what is causing all of these refugees to try to escape that region. And of course, it's our foreign policy with wars and false narratives that makes these people so mad, that makes these people hate us so much that the very sight of a white person, whether it be European or American, they hate you. It doesn't matter if you open up your arms to take them in. It doesn't matter if you hand them welfare checks. It doesn't matter if they come into your country. They do not let go of their past way of life. They do not assimilate with our culture. And more than anything, you will have a percentage of these people that are just flat out radicalized. And as you've seen, the hate in their hearts cannot be kept down. So I would say we go with what Donald Trump wants to do and create safe zones in their own regions. Then we try to figure out what is going on in those regions, why all this war is going on. Of course, we know that there's religious wars that have been going on in that region for a long time. But the United States and other places in Europe decided to stick their nose in there and get involved with petroleum and overthrowing regimes in that region, which has not been proven a success. So let's keep in mind, as we see how the leftist policies with immigration have completely failed, now they're saying that they're going to have to start a civil war with Muslims in France. This is what is going on in Europe. This is the liberal agenda. And it has nothing to do with taking these people in. They don't care about their well-being. It's all about a voter block. It's all about getting these desperate people in, getting them on the government handout, and then getting them to vote for liberal policies. We are not going to let this come to our country. We have to realize the problem, and we have to cut it off at its head. We're not going to listen to Bill Clinton when he says rebuild Detroit with Syrians. We're going to rebuild Detroit with Americans. We're not going to listen to Hillary Clinton who says bring in 100,000 Syrian refugees from Syria. How about we fix the war, get out of that region, and stop this country from falling to Islam? The criminals are in this building, the people making laws that oppress others. That's the true crime. Criminals, people who put others in jail for plants, there's the crime. Our health, our choice. Keep Kratom legal. Our health, our choice. Keep Kratom legal. Don't ban Kratom. Don't ban Kratom. Don't ban Kratom. Don't ban Kratom. This is Ashley Beckford reporting for Infowars.com. I'm here at the state capitol here in Austin, Texas, to find out how patients feel about Kratom, a natural substance that possibly will be outlawed and made into a Schedule One drug. Let's find out. What is Kratom? Kratom is a member of the coffee family. It is an herb out of South and Central America. It is used all over the globe. It is used for things like pain management, stress relief, and people use it to get off opiates like Oxycontin or heroin. So it helps addicts to come off of these substances safely. It is a substance that's used by Austinites and people all over the United States. And unfortunately, the DEA just issued a statement saying that they intend to place it on the Schedule 1, which is where you can find LSD, heroin, and unfortunately, marijuana. And we feel this is a crime against humanity. I've been taking Kratom for five years. I broke my neck when I was 14 and used to take a bunch of medications, about 17 different prescriptions a day, to the point that I was on a couple things that were liquid morphine and then there was Adderall. Twice my daughter checked on me and I wasn't breathing. And at that point I decided to completely detox myself. And I had a friend who started a Kratom business who'd been trying to get me to try it for about four years. And like her, I didn't believe him. I thought he was insane and it tasted nasty. It's a leaf, what's it gonna do? And I am now five years free of any kind of pills. I don't take allergy medicine. I don't take Motrin. I don't take anything. And my daughter is the reason for that. 
Kratom has saved my life and gave me back the ability to just be a human being and not be a zombie. I found Kratom through my friend here after years and years and years on doctor prescribed opiates. Um, I had cancer, I had surgeries, and I have epilepsy as well. A lot of conditions, I could talk about the conditions on and on, and ever, nothing had ever worked, nothing had ever worked, more pain pills, I would be nodding off, I couldn't mm -hmm. work just because of the medication they were giving me. We want the, the option to self-medicate and take care of ourselves. This is such a valuable substance, my husband uses it for stress, many people we know use it for pain management. They say it works better than marijuana for them, it works better than any sort of prescription that they've had, with very little side effects whatsoever. It's also great for sleep if you have trouble sleeping. Personally. Kratom's done a lot of good helping me with pain. I've ripped my knee, I've had a hernia, I've had all sorts of degenerative back issues and arthritis. And as far as it goes, it's been one of the only things that could actually help with my pain. There's a difference between that which is legal and illegal and that which is ethical and unethical. And just because the government makes it illegal and it is a Schedule One doesn't mean you still, still won't be able to access it. However, there's going to be a lot more risk involved. There's different strains and they have different alkaloids with different properties. So when I'm managing my fibro and my sciatica and my arthritis and mood issues because of all the fibro, I can tweak the strain that I take to match the symptoms that I'm having at that time. And my fear is if we're going to have a pill ram down our throats, we won't be able to adjust the dose. The dose is so how we take it. Right. So they're going to be completely stripping that freedom away from us. I mean, I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia and arthritis 20 years ago. And since taking Kratom for two years, I don't need the prescriptions. I managed to help my mother after having both of her knees replaced. She was addicted to nasty pharmaceuticals and covered in rashes and walking around like a zombie. She wasn't functioning. She was as miserable as could be. And she finally came to me and I said, Mom, you know this is what I do, right? This is the chance to give it a fair shot at the board. She tried it. Changed everything for her. In three days, she was off the medicine, and in under three months, she was off the kratom. A member of the coffee family does not belong on Schedule One. It simply does not. And we have a right to our own health care. We simply have that right. No one has a right to come in and tell us what to do with our bodies. And this is just another example of egregious oversteps of the federal government. Fewer people should be in bars, especially people who are recovering addicts. So we want to make sure people have a safe option. I do not take any medicine at all anymore. No prescriptions. Not even ibuprofen. Nothing. Just Kratom. I think it's a cure. A lot of us don't take the Kratom every day. We don't need it every day. We use it responsibly, like medicine. We don't use it to get high. We just we need it to get by in life because sometimes we hurt. People still use marijuana even though it's illegal in Texas. There's immense benefits of that herb, of that substance. I'm not even going to call it drug. So if they do make it illegal, people will continue to use it. And then more than ever, we need to rally together to make sure not only people still have access to it, if somebody wants to be an entrepreneur on the black market, all power to you. Uh, but also, if somebody gets in trouble, we need to be there for them. Bail them out. Go to court with them. Help them raise money for an attorney. Because this is really beneficial stuff. And just because the government says it's illegal doesn't mean you have to stop taking it. There's also a rally taking place in D.C. and cities all across the country. And if they decide to go forward with this and place it on Schedule 1 on September 30th, we are going to be asking our state lawmakers nullify this the same way they've been nullifying marijuana across the country. The concept is called nullification or state sovereignty, the notion that states can opt out whenever the federal government tries to exert a power not enumerated in the Constitution. All right, folks, and you can watch that full report at Infowars.com. That's going to do it for tonight's broadcast. The Infowars Nightly News will return, Lord willing, tomorrow evening, 7 o'clock p.m. Central. Until then, 
Have a blessed evening, and we'll see you back right here tomorrow. Good night.